Here we are, the Beer Idiots Cheers. in Prague. This is the second days of the Brewers Forum. Uh, we attended quite a few sessions yesterday, and uh, today's the last day. It's been an amazing uh, experience. We've heard what, what's interesting about this year's edition mm -hmm. is that there's been a lot of sessions actually devoted to small brewers, yeah. meaning craft brewers, independent brewers, family brewers, who, uh, and uh, we're going to talk about a bit, just give you a bit of an overview and flavor of it. Yeah. I went to a session about uh, beer competitions. Well, hold on. You're supposed to ask me about craft. Oh, craft. I went first. I woke up earlier. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> Guilty on that one. Craft. Well, one of the first sessions in the morning on Monday was uh, what was craft? What is the definition of craft? And is there a definition of, definition of the craft brewery? And there we had some really interesting debate led by one of the speakers was uh, Pete Brown, who wrote a, a book really uh, looking at what was the craft industry and how you could define it. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, uh, he and also attending was uh, Paul Lefebvre, uh, family brewer. Uh, uh, Pete uh, gave a session where he said, well, you know, independence is important. He said it's really difficult to define. It's about the passion. It's about uh, quantity, but you know, in America, he noticed people mm -hmm. really debate what at what size do you stop being a craft brewer? But independence and passion came out as the most important thing, and doing, uh, doing the beer that you like to drink and want to produce, and not the beer that sells. Although he mentioned that that's kind of a balance, because of course, if a beer you may not like uh, sells, you need it to support the other beer. And mm -hmm. this is what uh, Paul Lefebvre of uh, Brasserie Lefebvre, Lefebvre in, uh, in Belgium, said because he came out in a really interesting talk he came out and said he described the brewery family brewers so many generations i think mm -hmm. it's five generations it's now run by yeah. him and his sister and one of the things he asked the question was do you consider me craft and uh, <laughs> good one good one good yeah, one yeah, and uh, yeah and it was a really yeah. interesting question yeah. and he said you know people didn't really answer because <laughs> 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 but he said you know what i feel i'm craft he says, I'm producing the beer as I like. I'm not involved so much in the brewing process, but he gave his background, his knowledge. He does know the brewing. He says, yeah, there's beers there. You know, I might not, but all the beers I produce are good. And, you know, while we're, you know, we're doing some things, we're continuing a tradition and we are independent. And we mm. produce this much beer, uh, you know. And he said, really, he got down to the core, which was the passion. Yeah. And now, what about your session? I went to a session of uh, beer competition. Mm -hmm. uh, quite interesting. It started uh, first with uh, Luc de Rademacher. Um, he gave a talk, a very lean presentation about, okay, what is the beer competition and what are the, the reasons that brewers want to subscribe and what are reasons that they don't want to subscribe. It was, um, it was quite insightful. He was like, okay, one of the reasons that sometimes people don't subscribe is like the price. Yeah. And then, okay, but why would you subscribe, for example? Um, the previous talk before um, was more like an academic talk and was like, all right, so we did a, in America a, a, a research, mm -hmm. scientific research, um, and they came with this matrix, like if your brewery is in this part of the, um, the quadrant, then it might not make sense for you to subscribe to a beer competition. And they gave a beautiful example of a person that also was on stage of uh, West Malle. Mm, uh, yes. If you're already considered one of the best, why would you send your beer to a beer competition? Because, okay, if you get a golden medal, everybody would say like, oh yeah, it's West Malle. Of course they have a golden medal of triple. But if they win a bronze or a silver or nothing, yeah. Then it's like, yeah, then it actually damages your reputation. And they did a whole scientific study that you can also download um, about, okay, if you're a smaller brewer, why would you do that? Um, one of the downsides can be like, if you win a medal, mm -hmm. yeah, can you catch up with the production? Ah, uh, yes. Can you meet the customer's yeah. expectation? Because another interesting thing, I think, from that, 
talk because I popped in briefly was uh, the Beer, uh, consu beer Consumers uh, Union or organization. Mm -hmm. And they were quite tough. They were, but what they've done is set standards for beer dredging to, make, to ensure yeah. that there's yeah. a, a quality and that because there's so many beer competitions springing up that some of them are, you know, and they're handing out the medals because people see it as a lucrative thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have set a standard. And I remember and an Luke. An list even on their website even. Oh, you right, can, of judges. Up, there is a, a list on their website, mm -hmm. like we endorse these competitions. Mm -hmm. And competitions that are not on there, they're not endorsed by them. And they need to work by a certain ethic. Yeah. And that is like, all right, is it clear for everybody what the rules in the competition are? How do you choose a judge in some competitions? You need yes. an endorsement of three other judges to be there, even ah. a judge in the competition. In other competitions, it's like, yeah, we just invite somebody, he comes and okay. The, are the rules clear? Is the definitions of the styles clear? Is how the medals are given out, is that clear for everybody? And that's a whole quality track um, where a beer judge from Italy, the the organizer, the organizer also the Italian uh, beer competition, did also research, research run for a presentation. It was really like, all right, these are the quality setting standards and bars that we need to be aware of uh -huh. and need to guard in the beer competition scene. That was a very insightful talk also. Yeah, and like I think one of the funny things was when somebody from the beer consumers it stood up and said, why don't you publish all the names of the people who from the put in their brews? The <laughs> from the breweries and the beers that are submitted. And, and then uh, Luke answered uh, yeah. that like very clearly, like, like yeah. he always does like, yeah, then no brewer will send his beer anymore. Yeah, yeah. Because, <laughs> and that's quite... Nobody like wants to be known as a loser. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's also quite logic. That's quite logic. That's quite logic, yeah. Um, yeah. So that was good. And uh, I went to, uh, my next one was uh, UNESCO, registering the ah, beer culture yeah, 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 yeah. onto UNESCO. Czechia. Pardon? For Czechia. Well, no, it was uh, just a discussing because uh, sitting there were representatives from Germany, a very interesting guy I interviewed. Mm -hmm. uh, a representative, of course, Christian Magul from the brewer, uh, Belgian Brewers, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, a lady from the Czech, representing the Czech uh, Association yeah. for Brewers. And yes, what was interesting is that I hadn't realized. Uh, was that Belgium had a global recognition as an intangible cultural heritage. For UNESCO Global. For UNESCO, whereas yeah. Germany got it uh, for regional because it's very difficult to get overall for a country. And it's amazing how, and Christian really explained, and uh, we'll, we'll do an article later, and really explained how they took the care in preparation because it's, it's easy to get a regional or a region yeah, recognizes yeah. an intangible cultural health, but for a country. Belgium uh, is quite small, so. No, 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 but it's <laughs> quite easy to get Lambic or Gers or ah, something, yeah, like yeah, yeah, or yeah, a yeah, beer yeah, yeah, style yeah, yeah. or a local thing, yeah, but, but to, get it, yeah. to get it recognized as a, well, for yeah. example, Germany has a regional recognition, and for Czech, Czech Republic, the woman is saying, you know, she was listening to us how difficult it was, and really it's a difficult thing because, and they were talking about the dangers now for other countries trying to do it because now, you know, UNESCO is really looking, should we be recognizing alcohol products and things or just the, uh, you know, as a culture? Of course. Uh, <laughs> well, that's for a question. But no, but that's, that's the debate, and that's the thing that could... And for example, for the Czech Republic, she handed out papers saying, what do you think of Czech beer? And we, we have to remember, it's a kind of a monoculture in a sense. It's pills. And you know, I really, style-wise, uh, yeah, it has a history. And I really must say, can we say it's an intangible cultural heritage for the Czech Republic? It depends. And, and you really have to look, because you know, it's easy to register in a sense, tangible things, but yeah. to recognize it as intangible, that is something that's been part of the culture, is in all, you know, in all festivals, because you can't recognize a festival or you can't recognize uh, a brewery or a, you know, because yeah. the things 
are part of the culture. It's also part of the yeah. beer. You know, it's the bars, it's the people, it's the passion, it's the yeah, it's way it's a invested in a home. cultural package around it. Yeah, also yeah. And they have to be really careful because, uh, you know, Kirsten, uh, the brewers, uh, the Belgian brewers are working now on, uh, because you have to reapply every... Every seven years. Yeah. yeah. And it was delayed from last year because, uh, you know, because of COVID. So they're applying this year and they're really having to be very careful in how they portray it. So that was yeah. a really cool, cool talk. And what else did you uh, attend? Uh, educating beer consumers. All right. What yeah. was that like? Because that's a tough one for a small... Yeah, that was mainly about... Um, like the first talk was about labeling. Like, very cool very cool talk like what do we expect as a beer consumer mm -hmm. they did some research but like again quite scientifically like okay we have a representative group we ask them questions we s and we scientifically statistically see that it's a correct outcome um, what do we expect on a beer label and it was like do you want all the yeah of course you need the ingredients mm -hmm. do you want uh hop leaves like all right it's that hoppy or do you want a scale or do you want a number where do you get your beer education from is that from your friends is that from your bottle shop is that from youtube all those questions were in a in a research and then it went like okay so what do consumers expect mm -hmm. that brewers do on their labels so that they know what they're buying and and to educate them a bit like oh IBU, what is that? Um, I don't know. Um, oh, Plato. Hop What's Plato? Yeah, what is Plato? <laughs> and, and like, okay, the different types of uh, hops in that, like, how do you brand that? There is no correct way to do that, eh? Or the type of malts or... But how much alcohol is in there? And yeah, you just give a percentage. Well, you or, have to. Or you, do, or you do with a bar. Yeah, of course, some things are legally needed. But there are very good examples of like, oh, this is really nicely designed for either your average Joe or your beer geek that is like, oh, that brewery, I'm a bit more into the, the technicalities and the geek stuff, and I really want to know that on the can clearly before I buy it. Um, that was the first talk of it, and then there were some other talks, uh, also Jan uh, from Brussels, he did a talk like, what do we expect of styles? And he really went the academical and mm -hmm. uh, social way more. Like, it's okay to have different names because it's like music. You cannot know every genre of rock or metal, but you don't need to know every perfect style word in it. Um, and that was a bit of reaction on the presentation before that. Okay. That was of the consumers organization right. the same guy that asked that question yeah um at your talk and it was like we have too much and it was basically like we have too much names and styles and they give examples like okay we have an ipa we have a new england ipa we have a double ipa we have a imperial ipa like a black uh, MPA. yeah <laughs> how did that happen that we have so many different names for things that are not standardized Standardized. Standardized. Standardized, yeah, thanks. Standardized. Have another beer. So, <laughs> and he was like, mainly like, okay, why did that escalate? And why don't we have definitions to make it like that? But that's impossible to make, uh, almost. Uh, I think I don't agree with that. I like those, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. He, he just saying. Oh, like he was just an open question. An open question, like, why, how did it came to this? That and maybe. That it, no, no, that it's for consumers. They're confused. So, so confusing. Do you know what a cold IPA is? No, but I've drunk some. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, an IPA, as a consumer, is it, do I think it's bitter or not? Yeah, in the old days it was, but now with all the Nipa, tropical Nipah, yeah, 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 I Nipas, love them. Nipahs are not I bitter, but it's like, as a, for, for, again, the talk was from the perspective of the normal consumer that don't know too much about beer. And that's their job. And that's their yeah, job yeah, to yeah. advocate for the consumer. Yeah. And I remember they were, you know, I also came in at the end a bit. Uh, and one of the th questions I heard uh, was discussed was one person was saying uh, in the panel, or was it Luke? Uh, no, Luke wasn't there. No, Somebody wasn't saying, there. Uh, you know, I wish we'd take off uh, expiry dates and just put on production dates on the, you know. As a, as to educate the consumer, mm. and uh, or at least there was in one of the talks, 
and they hope for the day, well, you can have both. I think production dates, uh, because he's saying, you know, expiry dates are meaningless. Some people love drinking beer at different dates. Uh, yeah, so it's all a matter of educating the consumer, and I think that's what the craft industry has done really well. They had to really, you know, every craft good, brewer had yeah. to, had to end, because when they were introducing all these styles, they really had to tell, educate the consumer, hey, you know, Yes, there's all these other beers produced by the big producers. We're trying to produce something different. Here's what we're doing. But also, when, when let's say, um, a certain brewery is very good at a certain style, yeah, and you want to compete with that as a smaller brewer, like as a small craft brewer, yeah, make it a little bit different, give the style another name, and you're king of that style that you invented. Eh? You can always invent your own style. And that's a bit chaotic and that escalated in the industry a lot and standardization is not always there and it was really from, from a consumer's perspective. And that's perspective. what I like, yeah. Um, but uh, it was a very open discussion. It was not a discussion like good or bad. Yes. It was a discussion like this is a state where we are now and what can we think do. and do and, and what what is the path forward or what to help consumers understand all these different yes. styles and techniques yes. and and uh, my thing while you were there i went to a talk on how to manage brands do's and don'ts uh, uh the one talk that was interesting to me for us from a person amber asfa uh, representing the swinkles family brewers uh, you know, from the Netherlands, I, I thought they're, and they actually are based all over, they're actually quite big because, and she was describing how they market, you know, started a brand in, uh, in uh, Ethiopia and how they went out first and did, before even releasing the beer for months and months because, you know, people had access to cheap beer, mostly made from sorghum mm. or uh, other things. Uh, and they went into the market and decided they were first going to, in a way, educate the community and prepare the community for the launch of this beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they made, first of all, they made uh, community uh, yeah. liaisons. Yeah. They, yeah. they uh, got people to invest in the beer, like actually yeah. put some money in. So they had 5,000 shareholders. So these yeah. people were automatically ambassadors yeah, for the yeah, beer. Yeah. Um, and then they uh, liaised with a local football team and supported them for six months before they even launched a beer to show them that they were long-term commitment, whether yeah, the yeah, beer uh, failed or not. The commitment up front. Yeah, uh, a commitment yeah. up front yeah, and, to, yeah, and to trust. And then they launched a beer and, uh, you know, it was packaged in a certain way and uh, even their commercials. They showed me this amazing commercial. Didn't even mention the beer. It just showed the community, local communities working together and celebrating together yeah, without yeah. any sign of a beer. Also not the coziness like in the bar, we're cheering. There was no beer. No, no, uh, that's uh, what they're saying. You know, different type yeah, of marketing yeah. to a different type of audience. Yeah, uh, 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 market also, right? Yeah. yeah. So Tuesday, that was, uh, that was Monday and uh, you know, uh, and Tuesday. Well, I was there for the uh, blockchain one, which was astounding. I must admit, I was expecting a technical talk, and what I got was a really broad overview, and it was a session, one of the sessions that was really geared towards smaller brewers. Mm -hmm. um, and the way it came out is that there's more for smaller brewers to get out of blockchain than, say, the bigger brewers who are already starting to use it, or at least uh, if they're not using it, they're using it for branding and marketing and looking after their uh, customers and the for transport. Marketing. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 for the not for marketing because it's a really a transport a logistical yeah, supply yeah, chain. Yeah, uh, of the supply yeah. Chain, yeah. and uh, he was saying, you know, all of those are private and smaller brewers, you know, they don't have the time or the thinking, and they look at it and they just say, I don't want to deal with it. They may have four hours a week to deal with things like that. So he was saying, what we really need is a public block, uh, blockchain for beer, uh, where its access is open to them, you know, so they get the security of the blockchain, uh, they get the transparency of the blockchain, that is between suppliers, so they know, yeah. you know where a certain thing is and what is the quality of the supply. 
and uh, and uh, of course they discussed the risks, which I think is what your major concern was. And yes, he said the risks are your data could be taken over, it could be stolen, uh, that could happen anywhere. But the the consensus was that you know you're going to use blockchain whether you like it or not or whatever the risks. So it's best to get on. And one of the interesting things is he oh. called on the Brewers Forum to uh, to really uh, create this space for smaller brewers. To sponsor or a project, basically. Well, or a government <laughs> yeah. to sponsor <laughs> a, to public, spo so uh, yeah, a public a public thing, so yeah. that uh, the public uh, a public blockchains, not in the sense of that it's open to the public, but in the sense that it's, it's access for the smaller brewers w that they can use it. Yeah, but m my concern with with that is, uh, yeah, I'm totally not going to go technical over this. It's like. Mm -hmm. I'm not not really yet convinced. Uh, I, I didn't see the talk, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I read I read the intro of the book a little bit, but yeah. And I'm for me, to, um, there needs to be practical functionality that's easy to use for mm -hmm. smaller brewers. Yeah. Because it's it are no tech nerds yes, whatsoever. Yes, that's true. So if you have let's say uh, a D app, decentralized application, that's very easy, accessible in your browser, and you can track stuff and all that nice little things. Yeah, we don't. I mean, my, for what I think now, we why should we set up a blockchain for that? There are enough public projects already. Like, yeah, there doesn't need to be one it's set up specifically for course, brewing. No, no, there are there are so many. Uh, Chainlink is a blockchain that is used already for supply chain tracking. Is totally built for. Yeah, that. they and did mention all, that all open source. Zones. And that's all open like it is. Yeah. You, you can fork it. And then host your own version, and who is going to do the maintenance then on on, on that and see that's worldwide installed? Hey, Dieter, what a market for you! No, it could be totally <laughs> not me. No, no, <laughs> not going to go with that. No, so I was quite skeptical about yeah. the, about the the content of that talk, but I will see it. I will see it. Yeah. I will see it in the, in the no, 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 it's exactly. It's online, it's a thing that's developing to keep an eye on. And for for me, it was like, yeah, to totally agree with the technology, but I found it a, a bit like pushed height here. Okay. And yeah. that's why I was like, uh, not convincing me. But okay. No, that's good. That's good to be concept skeptical. Wise, yes, it, concept wise, yes, eh? but mm -hmm. uh, totally agree. But found it a bit strange here. One of the interesting things is uh, one, uh, one of the questioners after stood up and said, "What about NFTs?" And uh, <laughs> <fuck> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, uh, one of the speakers, the main speakers there, the speak. guys, <laughs> no, he said, uh, "You know, we should focus on things that are important." Yes, yeah. AI and blockchains are going to, and he called it a renaissance. It's going to be a renaissance. So he was a real. Uh, no, there's totally but he but totally. what was surprising for me was to learn because there was another speaker there uh, saying you know NFTs are being used by brewers the bigger brewers for marketing and I'd never thought of that concept before yeah, col collectibles probably yeah like a, a lot of soccer clubs are doing that also in the US now eh? you in the old time you had yeah. baseball cards eh? right now they make just an NFT of cards of collectibles and they put that NFT to store the ownership they put that on a blockchain and then you have an nft so you have a digital baseball card with everything but, uh, but uh, one of the interesting things is that uh one of the the speakers from greece who owns a small brewery on an island he was super uh in the sense that he said uh nfts could be a future uh for securing say if you want to buy a barrel a share of a barrel of beer somewhere it could be used to lock in that value so through an NFT, I you know, I don't know how that could be done, but he said, yes, if you want to sell beer in a certain way yeah. and shares in a barrel that's maturing, yeah, but that could be one way totally to do agree it. With that with, with, with a smart contract. Yes, that's what he talked about. It was smart, smart contract. And then you have an oracle, let's yeah. say you now have a, a lawyer's contract um, saying, if the shares of that company or that, you get so much of that. All the legal stuff, yeah, you can also code that in what they yeah. call a smart contract, put that on the blockchain and execute it automatically. Through an NFT? No, no, through smart contract technology. Oh, for and, and that's going to be the future, totally agree with that. Eh? But then you have to have to find a really easy to use application for smaller brews because they're not going to go to find people to code that. But okay, getting way too 
<laughs> no, but it's interesting. This is, <laughs> but <laughs> these are the things smaller brewers and the craft brewers have to think about, uh, either as they grow, right? Either as they grow and they get a little bigger, it be, might be, you know, because uh, some of the craft brewers that started as one or two a people operating have grown up now, and they, they do have the people and the staff or st starting to think well, about those things. Concept, I'm going to close it off within uh, one minute, but another concept in the blockchain that I find quite interesting is fan tokens. Yeah. Did they mention that? No. That's something that, so oh, bigger brands like Disney are going to come up with tokens, mm -hmm. and that are fan tokens, give you certain extra rights, some, some things you get and stuff like that. So it's basically... A blockchain token that you buy, you buy hundreds of thousands of them, eh? mm -hmm. it doesn't matter, it's not one euro, the price you can choose yourself. But fan tokens, that's going to be a thing, because if you have a community, and that, that's what the craft beer scene has, they have a community. You have brewers and yes. they have a community around them. If that you then say, I make, let's say, one million fan tokens on the blockchain, and people can have that on their phone easily and can trade that and can pay with that, that's cool. Eh? Let's, let, like, for example, let's say Cantignon makes a Cantignon token. and they release one beer a year that you can only pay with your fan tokens. You have to buy Cantillon fan tokens then on the blockchain. You can buy them everywhere. You can trade them and it's in instantly settled. Oh, good. So fan tokens for breweries, I totally believe in that concept. Totally. Okay. Fan tokens. Great. And the other session I went to, uh, very much for the small, brewer small breweries, was... Uh, and by the way, community, that's the one thing I forgot yeah. uh, to mention about the talk on what is craft. That was the other key thing about craft, community, local, that they build communities, they become places for communities to gather, they are invested in the local communities. Not that the big brewers don't do it, but they do it from a very high level, yeah. whereas the, uh, the local craft brewers becomes a a place that's really invested it's in community because it has to you know uh, because it's built out of as you say crowdfunding in many cases and mm -hmm. that's part of its community the other uh, one I went to was the uh, sensory uh, how to develop a sensory control uh, policy in a small brewery uh, uh, that was uh, uh, really really interesting um, and uh, one of the interesting speakers was uh, a, a woman named Liz uh, Pratt, who lives in Amsterdam, does it for a small brewery. She's also actually the co-founder of the uh, Pink Boots for the Benelux re region. I, um, and we talk, talk to her extensively, but she was really saying, you know, if you're a small brewery uh, and you only have four hours a day, don't throw out the sensory things or panel testing because you don't have a lab yeah. And then you must depend more, you know, less on the technical side of quality testing. Don't throw away quality testing. It's the way that's going to help you keep competitive. And she said one way is to do this, to emphasize more the sensory perception. That means you, from right from the starts, from smelling, tasting, uh, visual mm -hmm. clues from the hops and really focus on it and really really structure it and she showed some ways how you can structure it we'll interview her and show some of those things and the panel testing where she sh gave some basic you know don't leave it as open questions really if you got four hours structure that even if it's a small panel use that and and use the same panel develop them so that you can show that your your beer even for the same beer produced have that panel how once do, a how week do you see that a small panel is representative for your audience then well if it's even your five if friends well it's like eight or nine because well you in a way she showed how you have to educate them to your beers and uh, educate them into the sensory perception and rule out the outliers and slowly over time they develop how to through these questions that she asks you know it's not open questions, it's very specific questions. It doesn't take long. And she mm -hmm. says, mm -hmm. people start getting into it. She says, one of the most amazing uh, testers, panel testers, can be the, the people you wouldn't even expect. One was in finance, turned out he was really passionate because you sit them down in a room and you give them beers to taste, they really start getting into it. But you must control that passion because you know, they take a break, they're tasting beers, and to them that's, you know, if they're already interested in beers, that's interesting. And one of the interesting things was 
tasting the same beer over a period of time, different brews, mm -hmm. to help you keep that quality. Um, but sh anyway, we will do an interview with her, but we, you know, we'll also do a write-up on the thing. And I think this is really important for the craft brewers to, uh, and the smaller brewers to help them stay competitive in what is turning into a tough market right now. Yeah, uh, uh, uh. Cool. yeah so we've been there and uh, we've got a few more sessions. The last session, which will be uh, with a couple of people we've sort of been having fun with over the last two days, uh, will be the water quality session, which I think will be interesting. Yeah. All right, so we're signing out right now. Hope that was interesting for you. I think it was. And it's just a taster of the Brewers Forum in Prague. Greetings from Prague, you guys. And I've got some <laughs> beer left, and you don't. No, I'm already out, <laughs> idiot.